Unemployment down. Participation in the job force up. Jobs created looks pretty strong. But how come people aren't as excited as you would think they should be? Let's talk about that after a two-week hiatus of Get Right with Lily McAllister starting right. Why, you Wesley Webbit. Well, hello there, and welcome back to another edition of You Know What This Is. Let's let's not act like we don't know each other all of a sudden. Just because we had a little Thanksgiving turkey and a little bit of time off, let's not act like we don't know who each other is and that we don't love each other and that we're not trying to get to the same place as a nation, as a community, even though you and I may agree on some things and may disagree on some things. But you know... You know what this is all about. This is Get Right with Lenny McAllister. It's the podcast where you and I get a chance to vibe. You know the deal. Twitter, it's L-E-N-N-Y-M-C-A-L-L-I-S-T-E-R if you want to comment on what you may think is sheer brilliance or insanity or someplace in between and most likely someplace in between leaning further to the right. And Of course, depending on what you want to consider right, that's on you. (laughs) <laughs> and if you want to find me on Facebook, you know the deal. It's tinyurl.com slash L-E-N-N-Y-P-A for the PA native back in my hometown of Pittsburgh, G-E. It's tinyurl.com slash Lenny Page. And there's so many, so many, so many things to talk about. I think I will wait to talk about the passing of Nelson Mandela until Tuesday. I think that's probably the most appropriate thing to do because that's when the memorial service will be. That will be when people around the world, leaders around the world, including President Obama, will have an opportunity to speak at the memorial service. That will be an, an interesting that will be an interesting event because this is this is one of the few people worldwide that had a very, very unique blend of friends, and and that was respected by all people across not just the globe, but across ideologies. And that's what makes the the story of Nelson Mandela from, to be quite honest, non-violent activist to advocate of civic warfare to political prisoner to released political prisoner, and even before he was released, he was more of an icon, he was more of a legend that grew a sense of awareness for apartheid internationally, who then became a released political prisoner, who became a, I wouldn't say a pacifist, but definitely a healer, uh, and then a president, and then a, an international humanitarian. So it's a very fascinating life, but I don't want to get into that today. I think that um, we'll wait until the memorial service tomorrow just in case something transpires that we want to um, address or talk about or, or we need to discuss. So forgive me if I put that away for just a second. However, let's get to, um, let's get to something that everybody seemingly always forgets about in America. And it's the daggone economy. I don't care what anybody says. People can continuously tell you, no, I don't forget about the economy. I don't think that we have forgotten about the struggling of Americans around the world. But that's just simply not true. If you look at the numbers, you look at 
the media, you look at what politicians talk about, whether it's in the state capitals around the country or folks on Capitol Hill or folks coming out of the White House, whether it's the press secretary or the president himself. We are constantly talking about everything else, everything else except the working class everyday American that is struggling, having a hard time keeping the lights on, having a hard time meeting the mortgage or the rent, having a hard time keeping food on the table. And that that has to be discouraging. So with that in mind, with that in mind, I want to make sure that we have a chance to talk about the unemployment numbers that came out on Friday. I know I took a two-week hiatus. Forgive me. It wasn't a vacation. I, I guess it was a staycation in some regards. I didn't go anywhere. In regards to leaving my home, I did have an opportunity to do some things. Thanksgiving morning, I had a a good friend of mine, former congressional candidate, Sergeant Robert Allen Mansfield, came to Pittsburgh from Philadelphia, his hometown, and worked with me as a volunteer to give out Thanksgiving breakfast, really Thanksgiving lunch and dinner, over at the Jubilee Kitchen in the Hill District, in in the Pittsburgh, you know, in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, it's a, it's a section of Pittsburgh, very famous. It was basically basically Pittsburgh's version of Harlem in the early twentieth century, and it was really, 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 really great and satisfying, and um, just overall, just to, it was just touching. Not just to be able to to do that type of activity and to volunteer, but to to, to see the light in people. People that are struggling to keep a roof over their heads, people that are living on the streets, to see them still have a light in their eyes and a spirit in their heart of of joy. That is what Thanksgiving was all about for us. And then, of course, the following week just got ready as we move into this this Christmas season. But as I regress, the unemployment numbers came out on Friday of last week. And what did they say? Over 200,000 jobs added, which is a great, it's a great sign. That is a fantastic sign. Unemployment going down to 7%. We've seen the unemployment rate go down previously. But here's the thing about the unemployment rate going down that really resonates with me this time around. When the unemployment rate goes down and the participation rate goes up, at the same exact time. And that's something we haven't seen. We've seen the unemployment rate go down. That's no big deal. When you couple it with the fact that people were jumping out of the workforce and you you have seen the numbers be at the lowest points that they've been since the 70s. But this time around, you see it starting to reverse. Now, you can make the argument this is, you know, holiday season hiring. You can make the argument that this is fourth quarter trying to research. You can make the argument that because consumerism is up slightly because of the holiday spending, you need more employees. They're only going to be seasonal employees, and therefore this is not a true indicator. You have seen other economists. So I'm not not that I'm an economist, but uh, I, I you know stayed at a Holiday Inn last night. But you have seen economists sit there and say that long story short. We have seen the GDP initial numbers each quarter come out and look a particular way, and then we've had to truncate those numbers. We've had to scale back those numbers with a revision at some point in time later down the road that actually give a more accurate picture, number one, of where the economy is, and number two, and more unfortunately, give a picture that is not as optimistic as we would hope. So with these numbers, with Over 200,000 jobs added, initial initial numbers coming out for November. Then on top of that, looking and seeing that people are jumping back into the workforce, those numbers combined show us that maybe we're finally getting back on the right path. But here's the problem I have. Here's the question I have, and I want your feedback on this. You know where to find me on Twitter, L-E-N-N-Y-M-C-A-L-L-I-S-T-E-R. On Facebook, you know the deal, tinyurl.com slash landing page. Here's the question that I have. If we're adding over 200,000 jobs in one month for the nation, and if the unemployment rate came down to 7.0%, which usually it's 7-something. It's been 7-something for a while. We haven't seen 6 since George W. Bush was in the White House. And, and heck, we're in the second term of President Obama. When you combine those two numbers and the fact that the participation rate, the ratios of Eligible workers and people actually engaged in the workforce have come up. How come people are not as encouraged as we would think they would be? And I'm not talking about the economists. I'm not talking about the talking heads. I'm not talking about the White House. I'm not talking about people in Congress. I'm specifically 
asking the question, how come everyday Americans are not as excited about being involved in an economy that might finally, finally be turning around for struggling Americans? And here's why. Here's my theory. Again, you know where to agree or disagree with me. My theory is this. As you continue to look at this economy, as you continue to look at America post-2008, you do not see a United States of America in any way, shape, or form. It's not just economically. And heck, you, you heard the, the dichotomy being addressed in debates with McCain and Obama in 2008. Main Street versus Wall Street. And, and at the time, the argument was that Obama was Main Street. And McCain was Wall Street because McCain was just like the Republicans and he would have been the third Bush term. That was how he was painted, and that's the narrative that carried the day and, and, and in many ways stopped John McCain from becoming the 44th president of the United States. So we understand how that has played out. But since January 2009, there has been a widening gap in every – measurable for the most part that you can look at in America. You look at the economy, Wall Street has record profits, record profits, over 16,000 in the stock market. You look at struggling numbers of Americans, where they are, where they find themselves today, where they are as a family. You know, those that are working are either working less hours or their dollars don't mean as much. Those that are struggling are struggling even more than they were three years ago. The long-term unemployment, if you look at that, you look at the, the median length of time that somebody's unemployed in America, you're talking about over 36 weeks at this point in time. That is more than half a year. That is scary. I want you to think about that. You lose your job when there are six inches of snow on your streets on your sidewalk. You start working again when your kid's about to go back to school the following school year. Think about all the bills that you miss. Think about all the things that your children need. Think about how many meals that ends up accumulating into. We don't look at that. I mean, we're, we're at a point in time, unfortunately, that we're looking at these numbers and we have become so just overall glazed over numb to what the numbers look like, that even when good numbers come out, we A, are not getting as, as excited as we need to, and, and B, and this is probably more important, we are still not humanizing those that are struggling, because those that have are going to continue to do better and better and better and better as we move away from the official end of the recession, which by the way, that's another thing. There's one America that thinks that the recession actually ended, and that's a joke to me. If you go talk to everyday people, I had an opportunity to talk to somebody that does work in the nonprofit sector, and they said that phone calls into their organization in the, the region that I live in, Western Pennsylvania, it's up by 66% over a 12-month period of time for people asking for basic needs, food, shelter, clothing, keep my lights on, keep my gas on in the wintertime, help me with rent assistance. These are things that are basic necessities. This is not people having to cut back on vacations. This is not people having to trim back on their 401k contributions. That's what we saw during other hiccups. That's what we saw, if you will, after 9-11. That recession. That, that recession is completely different than what we're seeing today. Today, you're seeing one America think that the recession ended a couple of years ago, and you see a different America that is wondering, who the heck are these economists talking to? Because even when 200,000 jobs come back into the American economy, as they did over November, you're still 1.4 million jobs in the hole since the Great Recession officially started, which, by the way, people forget that although we – had our attention grabbed, and not even just grabbed, but literally snatched in 2008. This recession was deemed as starting in the last quarter of 2007 when it started sneaking up on people. So we have, in essence, we're going on 10 years because we're about to get into 2014. So if this recession started in 2007, we're starting to approach 10 years where we're still over a million 
jobs in the hole. That is frightening to working class Americans. That is frightening to poor Americans. So when you ask yourself the question, this is my theory again, would love to get your feedback. You know where to find me on Twitter and on Facebook. My theory is, even though you see these numbers coming in, even though you see people jumping back into the workforce, and by the way, the participation rate is still the lowest since the late 70s. So although it's not at its absolute floor since 1978, I believe the number is, it's still not where we need to be to call it a full-blown recovery, which is interesting because economists have told us that the Great Recession has ended, but they haven't really told us that we're really in a recovery. They say it technically, and this is the beauty of academia, wink, wink, nudge, nudge, is the fact that you can put all kind of labels on things as much as you like, but if you talk about the reality that people are facing, it's completely different. You cannot take what you read in a book and just because you read it in a book, take it and go pay your bills. There has to be some type of practical, tangible application to what you read that makes sense in the real world that's going to give you the resources necessary to pay your bills, to buy food, and do the things that you need to do. So when you continue to hear these things from economists saying that the recession ended and we're actually in a good recovery, and this is the, what, maybe they'll say something along the lines of 30-something or close to 40 straight months of job growth. That's all well and good. But some of those months were 60,000 jobs added, 80,000 jobs added, 105 added, not 105, but 105,000. And then it gets adjusted one way or another. Same way with GDP growth. We'll hear about 3.2%, and then it'll be adjust it back to 1.7%, 1.8%. 1.7%, 1.8% of GDP growth is not good. 85,000 jobs added in a month for the United States of America is not good. So even though you continue to see the unemployment rate go down, it should be encouraging to see jobs added to the economy. But again, you look at the working class, you work you look at those that are working those 35 hours a week, those folks that may get kicked off of their employer health care insurance because of Obamacare, the folks that are impacted by the political tussles that are out there in America, you would think that they would be the people that would be most excited about what's going on right now. They would be the folks that would say, hallelujah, finally, we got some good job numbers. Finally, we got something that shows actual recovery after years. And by the way, the average American that's unemployed on a long-term basis, after 31 weeks, 32 weeks, 33 weeks, 34 weeks, you would think that they would look at these numbers and say, yes, maybe, just maybe, I can see the light at the end of the tunnel. But again, and I, I've said this, there are two different Americas. Now, we say this about racial disparities. We say this from a socioeconomic standpoint. And when you say this, people say you're either playing the poverty card or the race card or you're being socialist or communist or anything else, which, by the way, we'll talk about that during Mandela Day because that is something that has gotten on my nerves. Once again, I love my fellow conservatives, but we'll talk about that during Mandela Day tomorrow. We talk about the disparities in America, but the reason why it's important to talk about these disparities in America is not to create tension. Actually, it's a, di it's a contrast to that. It's the flip side of that, if you will. You have to be able to show a diversity of perspectives because we do live in a complex nation where if we don't have solutions that make sense for poor people and middle class people, there's no such thing as growing wealth for your middle class. There's no such thing as getting people from working class to middle class. There's no such thing as allowing the poor to have an opportunity to be self-sufficient over the next 12 months, 24 months, 36 months. Like I said, you're talking about long-term unemployment being at going on two-thirds of a year. You're talking about, I got laid off January 1st. I get a job again when my kids start school the following school year. But you don't think of that... Long-term unemployment's not supposed to affect his or her grades, affect his or her resource needs for school, affect the lights being on, the gas being on, getting back and forth to school, getting back and forth to activities, enriching your academic 
endeavors, being part of the, the innovative drive to be global leaders in the 21st century. These are the things that we're missing out on as we allow these numbers to be two-dimensional, which goes back to why some in America see these numbers and they're feeling pretty good about them, but the people that you would think the people that you would think would be the most excited about 200,000 jobs added, unemployment rate going down, more people feeling encouraged about the job force and thus jumping back into the labor force, looking for work or gaining work. The people that you think would be most excited about this, they just simply aren't. And that, if anything else, should be discouraging to Americans overall. That's an indication of the politics we're, f we're facing today. That's an indication of the leadership that people feel is or is not, more likely, out there in America. That's reflective of where we are from a cultural and civic standpoint. And that, more than anything else, should scare you. Because yes, you can get people back to work. You can get people to be able to buy their basic needs. But America did not become great by being mediocre. And I know that sounds like a dichotomy, but you get my point. America did not become great by doing just what was necessary to meet the average standard. We always were striving to exceed expectations always striving to be great, always striving to have twice as much as the previous generation, to provide twice as much hope, to provide twice as much prosperity and freedom and liberty and everything else. And if we do not, and I'll say this as I wrap up, if we do not grasp that in a holistic way, even as these numbers find their way to continue to improve, the folks that should be most excited about these numbers just simply won't be what's your take on this you know where to find me on twitter l-e-n-n-y-m-c-a-l-l-i-s-t-e-r on facebook you know where to find me tinyurl.com slash lenny page in the meanwhile we will talk about the memorial service tomorrow down in south africa with president obama and all of the global leaders that will be attending the memorial service for the global icon nelson mandela in the meanwhile you enjoy your monday good to be back looking forward to talking to you soon you have a wonderful wonderful day and thanks for hanging out with me once again tcngb take care and god bless